Um, so just the uh, objectives to, to describe kind of our clinical approach to patients who have these complex neuropathies, and you'll see the kind of testing that we typically will do with these at Mayo Clinic. Um, review causes of perioperative neuropathies, consider post-surgical inflammatory neuropathies, and then we'll review the data that we gathered. I'd like to start out with a case. Um, this is of a 49-year-old woman. Uh, she has diabetes mellitus, and she underwent a radical nephrectomy, so they took her kidney out, uh, both under general and epidural anesthesia for uh, renal cell cancer. When she awoke, uh, she had numb and weak lower limbs. So initially, she couldn't move them at all or feel anything below her waist, and the assumption was that this was all related to the anesthesia and that it would wear off. But uh, it didn't wear off, and in fact, three days postoperatively, she started to develop very severe stabbing, pins and needles sensations in her legs bilaterally up to the knees. And then it kind of uh, settled in more on the right greater than left. She was initially wheelchair bound from these uh, deficits, but then by the time she uh, saw us, she was making some mild improvements, uh, being able to walk short distances with a cane. Uh, her left leg had improved a bit, but her right leg was still very severe um, with neuropathic pain and weakness. She was, uh, essentially had a flail foot. She couldn't bend her foot back, uh, dorsiflex or plantar flexor foot. And she had some weight loss associated with the surgery. So clinically, we uh, localized it to the peripheral nervous system and then confirmed that with nerve conduction studies in EMG, which assay the large myelinated nerve fibers. And it showed severe right greater than left sciatic neuropathies uh, and maybe some more suggestive of a wide, more widespread problem. Then we did what's called an autonomic reflex screen, where we are able to test uh, cardiovagal function uh, cardioadrenergic function, as well as uh, pseudomotor or sweat uh, gland function. And it showed some uh, sweat gland dysfunction, distal, uh, compatible with uh, C-fiber dysfunction in that right foot. The rest of her workup was entirely normal. So this is another uh, thing that we sometimes will use at Mayo. It's called a thermoregulatory sweat test. It's kind of a Coming from Minnesota, we, we tell patients we turn them into Minnesota Vikings, for those of you who are football fans. Um, essentially, uh, we use this uh, dye, powder dye, that turns purple when, when folks sweat. And then they're put in a, a, heat, con a heat chamber, brought to a, an elevated level, and we see where they sweat. And places where they're not sweating uh, is telling us some degree of uh, sweating dysfunction. It could be either central or peripheral. We don't put it on their face. She was not not sweating on her face, that's for comfort. But so you can see the areas where she had the surgery for her kidney removal, but she's also not sweating distally in her right foot and a little bit in the medial left foot. And then we did imaging. So uh, we have a 3T MRI that's used clinically, uh, mostly by the peripheral nerve group. And we have a peripheral nerve uh, radiologist, Dr. Kim Amrami, who's helped develop specialized coils that go right on to the area of interest to help with uh, resolution. And she looks at a lot of these and can see a lot of things that uh, I think some people don't, including me. But she noticed a slight prominence of her sciatic nerves greater on the right, which was compatible with her clinical scenario. And in her experience, it looked kind of a nonspecific inflammatory process. It didn't look like a cancer. It didn't look like some other specific inflammatory diseases such as sarcoid or CIDP. So here's some images that are a little hazy. So this is a coronal section, and the arrows are pointing to these strands on the right and on the left that are a little bit hyper-intense from normal. And then in cross-section, axial views, a bit pixelated, but you can kind of make out the, the bright sciatic nerve on the right. That's her bladder in the middle. And so what we often do in these patients who have severe neuropathies and we're not sure what the etiology of it is, uh, if they have deficits in that region, so we're not going to give them too much more de deficits, we actually take a bit of nerve and look at it under the microscope. So she underwent a sural nerve biopsy, which is a sensory nerve that's located down by the ankle. 
And so these are teased fibers. These are uh, single axons that are teased apart by the very talented technicians in our, in our lab, and then stained for myelin. And normally you would see nice uh, myelin processes with inner nodes of nodes run VA. Um, but this is what it looks like when there's axonal degeneration. This is kind of standard Wallerian degeneration. And she had a lot of it. Interestingly, uh, and to our surprise somewhat, was that she had quite a bit of inflammation also. So uh, multiple collections of uh, small mononuclear cells were seen throughout her nerve. Um, they reacted pro uh, prominently to a leukocyte common antigen, which mostly marks T and B cells. Um, we also did T and B cell staining, and it's mostly T cells. But it's not much in the way of macrophages. So if this were due to just a kind of cleaning up process from a traumatic injury to the nerve, we would expect mostly macrophages, because they are the ones that come in after a traumatic injury and clean up the myelin debris. Um, this, it's not felt that the lymphocytic infiltrates are a reactive process. This is more thought to be due to the underlying disease. And there's a fair amount of animal and human studies to back that up. She also showed evidence of uh, long-standing ischemic injury. Um, this is neovascularization, where after a, a vessel's been cut off, it starts to regrow little small immature vessels around it. So H&E stain on the left and smooth muscle actin, which labels the walls on the right. And she also had evidence of bleeding. So remember, her surgery's up in her belly, but she has evidence of ischemia and bleeding down by her ankle. And so her diagnosis was a severe neuropathy with features of nerve microvasculitis, um, because most of these uh, infiltrates actually were attacking the, ner the, the vessels within the nerve. And we treated her with IV methylprednisolone, which is a, a standard treatment that we use for uh, several of the microvasculitic neuropathies that we see that aren't related to surgeries. And she had a marked improvement of her pain. We saw her back three months later. She had been on heavy doses of narcotics. She was off those entirely. She was still on gabapentin. But she was getting around, walking around. Turns out a lot of the, the reason she was needing a cane was for pain reasons. So now she had a, a foot, or, foot orthosis on her ankle to give her stability, and she was walking around pretty well. She didn't see much improvement in her weakness, which might be expected given it's going to take a while for those nerves that are damaged to regenerate. And so kind of going back and thinking about causes of post-surgical neuropathies, kind of as I said in the introduction, most people have always thought these to be mechanical. So if you're a neurologist in the clinic or in the hospital, you get a consult for uh, somebody who develops a foot drop after a hip surgery, the assumption is, well, they did something when they're in the surgery, and that's why she has the foot drop. Um, ischemia can, can cause this, although, that, though this is less, less common because there's quite a bit of collateralization. Uh, you can have toxic metabolic. There's some literature suggesting that anesthesia itself can cause neuropathies. And then what we saw here, which was an inflammatory neuropathy. And so just talking about the incidence of mechanical post-surgical neuropathies, it's not very common when looking at kind of various studies, both of lower limb neuropathies following hip arthroplasties, pelvic surgeries, moved in the lithotomy position, cabbage, so coronary bypass often causes uh, brachial plexopathy, so weakness and pain in the arms. Um, and then ulnar neuropathies are a common finding, although in this retrospective review, it, didn't, it didn't, wasn't very uh, frequent. There hasn't been a lot of study on the sort of inflammatory neuropathies that we were studying. Um, there's an old study back in 1968. Uh, patients developed Guillain-Barre syndrome following surgery. They used biopsies for that. And then there's a pretty good literature on inflammatory brachial plexopathies occurring after surgery. This is sometimes even called Parsonage-Turner syndrome. And in their initial study in 1948, uh, a fair amount of their patients had had a, a surgery right before. None of these patients, however, um, are in these studies of brachial plexitis is confirmed it on biopsy. And so that first patient I told you about was actually the, the impetus for starting this study. 
And so we went back in the literature, or not in the literature, back in the charts at Mayo Clinic and then also started uh, asking around and talking with other uh, folks in the department and collected 23 patients who kind of fit the thought of it being a post-surgical inflammatory neuropathy and uh, that had had biopsies. And of those 23 biopsies, 21 of them had the sort of inflammation that I described earlier. This is just some of their demographic information on the bottom. Increased incidence of diabetes, smoking. Weight loss was very common in these patients as well. So uh, how did we include the patients in the study? They had to have a post-surgical neuropathy, obviously. Um, we just arbitrarily said it had to occur within 30 days of the surgery. It wasn't easy to explain by other reasons and that they had had a biopsy to confirm it. And we also had another uh, set of patients that I'm not going to talk about today that didn't have biopsies. Most of the patients developed their neuropathy within the first week, so uh, 14 of them within the first week. Some of them looked like, for all the world, that they came out of the surgery with the problem. They had a lot of the uh, signs and symptoms that we've been discussing uh, at this meeting, a lot of pain, and it had a varying qualities, aching, cramping, burning, lancinating. They had a, a lot of them had allodynia. They all had sensory loss, um, and most of them had weakness. A lot of them needed AIDS to walk, so these were pretty severe neuropathies. A variety of surgeries uh, preceded the neuropathies, um, and the, had a variety of uh, anesthesia that had been used for them. And we just kind of divided them to kind of get our arms around the problem into focal, multifocal, and diffuse. And I think the focal uh, neuropathies were of particular interest as we went through the, the patient's histories. Um, four of the six patients developed a neuropathy right in the region of where the surgery had occurred. So these are ones that, for all intents and purposes, purposes you would have thought was due to the surgery but you do a biopsy distant from the surgical site and they have lots of inflammation. Um, a fair amount of them, the majority had what's called a multifocal, so they had it in multiple limbs. Oftentimes it was migratory, so it started in one leg, then went to another leg, or an arm and a leg. And then a few of them had all four limbs involved, which is kind of a Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, these patients, for the most part, had uh, evidence of large fiber dysfunction. Um, that's a bit of a bias because we probably wouldn't have biopsied them had they not had uh, significant involvement this way. Um, it was mostly an axonal damage. Uh, we didn't see much in the way of de demyelination. And autonomic testing was done in, in roughly half of them and showed uh, problems as well. MRIs were performed in 17 of the patients, and as I said, Dr. Amrami is our peripheral nerve uh, radiologist, and uh, she saw increased T2 signal in all the nerves that were affected. Um, she didn't know where the, the problem was when she was looking at uh, the imaging. They all had at least slight uh, nerve enlargement. Gadolinium enhancement was not common in these patients. There was only one that had a gadolinium enhancement, and that patient was a little different than the other ones for other reasons as well. And so here's some more examples of T2 hyperintensity. So this is a lower trunk plex brachial plexus axial cut, showing some hyperintensity in the nerve. Yes? OK. No problem. Um, so uh, femoral nerves were enlarged, as well as the sciatic nerves in this patient. And then here, there's a rather large sciatic nerve. By definition, to be included in the study, they had to have inflammation so they, uh, in their nerve biopsy, and they all uh, had that, obviously. Um, a variety of uh, collections were found. Inflammation of the vessel wall, suggestive or diagnostic of a microvasculitis process, uh, was, only, uh, was 15 of the 21. And they did not have systemic vasculitis at the time in any way, shape, or form. 
So here are just some more examples of the sort of inflammation that we saw in these patients. I see large sheets of uh, inflammatory cells in the lower picture with a lot of ischemic injury and, and, and bleeding. And this is another example running along a vessel wall. And this is uh, interesting. So this is uh, an example of the microvasculitis. And so the left panel is uh, just a standard H&E stain. The middle uh, is staining the uh, vessel walls. And then on the right, it's uh, antibody directed to say whether they're uh, lymphocytes or macrophages. And these are two levels in the same nerve. So this vessel is this vessel. This vessel is this vessel. So there are just serial sections through it. And it really points out the, the very spotty nature of microvasculitis in these patients. Um, and so if you're not looking through a lot of the nerve tissue, you may miss it. If you're looking in this, if this was the only part you were looking at, you'd say, oh, that's normal. But clearly it's not in total. And so uh, most of these patients received some sort of immunotherapy. Again, our standard uh, treatment for these sorts of inflammatory neuropathies is an IV 12-week uh, course of methylprednisolone, uh, which is tolerated very well. And this is uh, kind of a schematic of how these patients did over time. This is really looking at their weakness. The NIS on the y-axis is a measure of a, a, a linear scale of, of weakness, and then over time. And if it's in the dark bar, it's when they were treating, being treated, and, and during the dotted areas, they're not being treated. So in summary, uh, most po post-surgical neuropathies uh, they may be mechanical, but there certainly are a proportion that are inflammatory that need to be considered. They can present in varied ways. Uh, pain is very common in these folks. Um, basically needs a high index of suspicion. Many of these patients seem to have a monophasic illness that didn't come back later. Uh, only one, one of the 21 had multiple episodes. And uh, really needs to be considered, especially when the neuropathy is distant from the surgical site, but as I pointed out, in six of our, uh, four of the patients, it was right in the same area. And this is just some of our uh, speculative pathophysiology. Um, you know, we wonder whether there's some combined role between the stress of surgery and the mechanical stress that can bring it on. Um, maybe they have some pre-existing mild inflammatory neuropathy, and there's also genetic predisposition, so there's an entity uh, inherited brachial neuritis, which is an inflammatory re recurrent uh, neuritis that occurs in, in some patients, um, often brought on by surgeries or uh, actually giving birth is a common reason for that as well. And that's it. These are the collaborators on the paper. Uh, we had uh, anesthesiologists, neurologists, and neurosurgeons, as well as uh, radiologists to help put it all together for Mayo. Thank you. We have time for some questions. If you're lucky enough to get a biopsy from the dorsal ganglion, what do we expect to see in, in those areas? Well, um, I would say that it, in most of these patients, they seem to have recovery of, of function over time, so it doesn't seem as though that it's a neuronopathy per se, um, you know, whether there's some secondary, you know, glial issues, but in terms of neuron destruction, I wouldn't expect to see neuronal destruction. Question. Mm -hmm. So you, the most extreme case seemed to be uh, people with Guillain-Barre mm. syndrome or like disease. So the extravasation of um, leukocytes and their infiltration through the, the epineurium. So the, do you see that as the time where autoantibodies might infiltrate into the nerve and exacerbate and create an exaggerated inflammatory reaction? It certainly is a possibility. Um, you know, with the patients who develop their neuropathies basically immediately after surgery, that'd be too quick for kind of an immune response. 
but whether you know after that there is a perpetuation of the neuropathy via uh, an immune response is you know, it's speculative. We're looking at it in our neuroimmunology laboratory. Any ideas about the vasculitis? What's causing it? What's um, interlinking it with the neuropathy? Well, um, a lot of these patients look very similar to a condition called diabetic amyotrophy. It's also called lumbosacral radical plexus neuropathy. It's got a bunch of different names. Um, pathologically, they're very similar as well. They often have weight loss, kind of acute to subacute onset of severe pain, weakness that uh, evolves over the course of several months and then kind of resolves on its own. Thank you very much for hope. Nancy. Quick question. On the non-diabetic lumbosacral radicular plexus neuropathy, can you see that microvascular? Yes. Yeah, it's the same pathology. One more question? Just, just a point of clarification. Were all these patients diabetic? No, no. Did I miss? No, about okay. a third. Were, but because certainly the diabetic patients could have, could have some predisposing neuropathy. Right subclinical neuropathy in the back. Did, was there any other um, observations that you made about these patients in terms of pre-existing conditions or situations with the patient? The only other thing that seemed to be more common was smoking, but you know, it was a very small group of patients, so we didn't really, we weren't able to make much in the way of associations. A couple of them had cancer. A couple of them had some elevated rheumat rheumatologic markers, but they were very mildly elevated.